There you go. So welcome back. It's nice to see a face in here. I've been sitting behind the desk staring at my laptop for like three years uh, trying to do classes. So I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager, if you don't know me here. Um, I'm here all the time. Usually Wednesday is the day I'm home working in my yard, but I'm here way too much. So and I'm here all weekend. So we can help you, help you with whatever you need. Um, like I mentioned, we are recording this. Um, so you can go back and watch it. They're probably saying hi, everybody who's watching online. We'll say hi to them one time. Um, it will do questions at the end and I think with you know 10 or 12 people I'm you know, so far maybe we'll get a few more join us um, I could probably get interrupted here and there but I'd rather just do questions at the end if we could um, one thing I will mention Dr. Lola's over here if you can see her behind the hydrangeas so Everett Clinic you know is a great local business here I live in Everett they've been here since I was a little child I've been going to them for years but they sponsor our classes and it's not that I'm getting money, Sunnyside's getting money. What we agreed on was five $50 gift cards every class, every month they, they provide for us and I get to give them out to you guys to spend here at the nursery. So so thank you, Every Clinic. Um, they're, they're our sponsor today for our, for our July class. Um, you know, if we look at, if we talk just kind of general hydrangeas, you know, everybody wants their yard to look great all year. You know, I want something in bloom every season. I always want something in color. You know, there's not a lot of choices for something that's going to bloom the entire summer till frost and fall. And hydrangea would be at the top of the list. You know, we talk roses a little bit for full sun. Hydrangeas we can do in sun and shade, or part sun, part shade. And that's the plant that I'm going to have to bloom now or a month ago. Mine started all the way until we get frost. So we'll, we'll look at a lot of hydrangeas today, obviously, and try to pick out some good spots um, in the garden for them. Um, if I take one of these little beauties home today, you know, typically hydrangea, and I don't mean this literally, but we call it nursery disease. So it's not a disease, there's nothing plague, but t plants get tired in pots in nurseries in the summer. It's, it's unavoidable. We water sometimes twice a day here, but it just needs to go on the ground. So you may look at, I brought one in on purpose, the bloom struck over there, the blue. He's kind of weeping a little bit. You know it's young the stems aren't super thick there's nothing wrong with that we get deadheaded it would shoot up more leaves and bloom again those are ever blooming but don't hesitate um, you know some of that stuff ends up making it back to our half price department which is great for you because you get a great plant for half price but there's nothing wrong with them sometimes the leaves look a little weird the weeping cabot whatever it's just we, we kind of jokingly call nursery disease they, they do get a little tired in the pots here in the summer <clears throat> if I'm gonna plant one of these you know, I take it out of the pot, you're going to have a pretty good, thick, fibrous root system. Let me pop, uh, see if I can pop one out kind of easily. Here's a little vanilla strawberry. So if I, if I pop one out of the container there, you're going to see, um, you're going to see some, some surface roots. Now, I don't need to rip this apart. I'm not going to destroy it, chop it in half. You can kind of see on there. I'm going to take my pruner tips and just lightly score that just to let them know, okay, you don't have to grow in a circle anymore. Now we can take off into the soil and get a root system established. So when you're planting containers, I'm always going to try to dig a hole, you know, two, three feet, two, two times the size of the container, twice as deep. Take your native soil, mix like one third compost or a good amendment to that, mix that all up together. That would be my backfill. Then I would always feed it when I plant it and then put a little mulch around it. That'll help you with the water this summer we are in the heat of the season. It doesn't mean we can't plant, but we want to make sure that thing stays watered. If I plant a new hydrangea, you know, any time of the year, but especially in the summer, I'm probably going to go out and check it every two, three days, water it very heavily, not just a quick little blessing, but very heavily so that it really saturates the root, water is deep down below, and then I get a deeper root system. If I go out there and do the quick blessing every night, I'm going to wet down about an inch of the surface soil, and I'm not going to have anything down lower. So if you're going to water, I'd always rather have you do it less often, but much deeper. So kind of keep, keep that in mind here for the summer. Now, if we talk fertilizer, you know, if I'm putting a new one in, absolutely add some organic food. I've got rose, rose and flower, and the roadie food. So either one, we'll kind of talk a little bit of pH and playing with colors and all that as we go through the class on some of these. But if I want acidity or a little bit of it and I want to keep mine blue, if you have a big round blue one or purple, this is going to help with that. If I'm the opposite and I want to keep mine pink or alkaline, I'm trying to beat nature and keep it the other direction, 
I'm going to use a neutral food or something that's not acidic like rose food. Either one works great. There's nothing wrong with either. I don't know that if you went and put rose food on your blue hydrangea one time, it's not miraculously going to turn the color any different. It's not going to change that quickly. What about the white? What do you use? Well, white, I would use the rose and flower food always. You could use either or, but for me, I use the rose and flower. Yeah, because we're not going to change the colors. The last one I brought is just this Ultra Bloom. Now, I put this on everything in my yard. Dahlias, containers, you name it. If I don't want growth, which all these are a nice balance, this is all about bud and bloom. So whether you're talking dahlias, your annuals, hydrangeas, rhododendron, it's a great thing to help your bud set on rhododendrons even in the summer. This is a great amendment to throw on there that's pure phosphorus, so I don't have nitrogen in there. Um, for growth, this is going to be all about bud and bloom. So ultra, ultra bloom might be something that's going to that's gonna help. We're going to do questions here right at the end, okay, so we can keep it going. Um, seed grow would be my water soluble option. So I want a hybrid you know, kind of organic, synthetic, this would be the way to go with seed grow. This is all purpose. There's a flower and bloom in there. But perhaps, you know, I've got a few hydrangeas in my own yard. I don't go out and do this every week or every two weeks or probably even once a month. But maybe I'm out feeding my containers on occasion. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and give the hydrangea a little bit of foliar food too. That's just a little extra boost. Water soluble acts always much quicker versus granular. So certainly you could supplement with a little bit of that as well. Now, if we talk timing, you know, like I said, I mentioned we, we, we fed hydrangeas when we planted them. We got a brand new one. If I have an existing one, I'm always going to try to go out and get my hydrangeas fed first part of March, maybe late May, early June, maybe one more time like mid-July, late July, you know, this kind of time of the year. And then I'm not going to feed much towards late summer, fall. I don't want a whole bunch of fresh growth. I just want to keep it happy there through late summer. So if you can do two times a year, you're probably ahead of most gardeners. If you can get it going out of winter and once in the early summer, ideally if we did three good feedings a year with that granular, you're gonna maximize your flower and have a very happy plant, okay? So a little fertilizing. Um, someone inevitably always asks on transplanting. This is the worst time of year to move anything, especially hydrangea. So never transplant during the growing season. I mean, maybe you've got a contractor that's been missing in action for two years and he's going to remodel your deck and he finally says hey i'm coming next week and you've got an old hydrangea on the corner that's like okay i gotta move that or it's done he's going to bury it put a post in the middle of it whatever okay then we might try to salvage it you're probably going to struggle to keep it looking good for a while but we would dig up all the roots we can get it in a pot real quickly water it put some transplant food on it try to keep it alive and then we can relocate it uh, somewhere else when he's done if you can wait till the winter, you'll have near 100% success. So if we walk out any time, say after hard frost, late November, up till like first part of March, I can excavate that whole plant up, you know, locate it in a new area in the yard, and I will not lose it. It will not be as bad um, as far as transplant shot. Okay? Yes? I tried to transplant in the fall. Yeah. November and March though? Yeah, yeah, any, any time after, you, the safest time is always when we're dormant. <clears throat> so hydrangea leaves kind of go yellow and then they melt. As soon as we get a hard frost and you, you've seen that happen, okay, let's go have at it any time over the winter okay, from there. As soon as yeah. Be yep, yep, yeah, then you usually get one that one good hard frost. Now there's not, you know, it depends on the season. This year we've been really wet, you know, for an extended period of time. I probably don't need to remind anybody of that. And now we're getting into the nicer summer weather. But if we, you know, we talk bugs and diseases, you know, mildew is probably a little bit more prevalent this year. I know in my yard, I've got some mildew on some things. I usually don't. It's not the plague. We're not going to lose the plant. It's easy to spray for. Hydrangeas aren't immune to mildew um, by any means. That's probably the main thing I would watch for, um, depending on where you've located them. You know, a little bit of sun will help. Drying them off will help. Not overhead watering will help. Um, and certainly air circulation is a big one with me. If you've got it in the garden, a bunch of things kind of crowding it out so you don't get the wind or the air through there, um, that will, you know, removing some of that or clipping it back a bit would certainly help, help some. Um, as far as bugs, you know, the only thing I ever really see, you know, when you get fresh new green leaves that are nice and juicy and full of sugar, I perhaps might get aphids, white flies, simple bugs. Again, not the plague, but something that's very easy that we could get a spray. Um, do a natural spray, you know, something like neem oil or pyrethrin, insecticidal soap. We don't have to go get 
you know, murder, death, kill systemic to kill an aphid. So it's very easy to, very easy to get a small uh, little spray bottle of something natural and take care of your bugs. All right. So if we go through, I'm going to kind of go fast and furious because I brought probably way too many plants in here to show. Um, but we'll go through different groups. If you kind of follow that handout, you know, we'll go through those different sections and I'll just kind of show you a few, you know, of my favorite um, hydrangeas. If we start with the the big leaf or the macrophylla, you know, that's the one where we have big round flowers, you know, sometimes round. If we look at, you'll see a lace cap in here somewhere. <laughs> well, here's one coming out. So you see when I say lace cap, we have that big flat flower with the open florets on the outside and then the sterile middle, both very nice plants. But we can get either style of flower in a plethora of choices these days. I mean, we can play with the color. There's some that don't turn. T typically, mop head hydrangeas are ones in armed climate right here in Western Washington. We're always going to be blue or purple because we have slightly acidic soil, if not more acidic. The color is going to be dictated totally by the pH of your ground. If you want to play with the soil and turn it alkaline, we had somebody before class say they've got an alkaline pocket, you know, then it'll be pink or red. So if you look at these plants, you'll see kind of a range of color if they're going to be alkaline, pinky red, all the way to acidic or purple blue. So if we look at the tags, it'll tell you right on there, you'll see a picture of both. But if you're into you know, playing with mother nature a little bit. I mean, you can really play with the color of these and get exactly the tone you want. I want lavender, I want a deep dark purple, cobalt blue, or all the way to the other end, you know, a pastel pink to kind of a raspberry red color. So these are ones that I can change the color of for the most part. Whites never change. So if I buy a white one, I have white. If I, any of these other ones in here that I see pinks, blues, different tones on, I'll be able to play with the color if you so desire, okay? So if we look at mop heads, <clears throat> and we just talk some generalities. Now pruning, you know, I don't, I'm not a fall, not a winter pruner on hydrangeas. This is something you really want to walk out and get done the first part of March. We don't want to do this going into winter. Sometimes we get a cold winter, you'll have some wood damage. If it was me, <clears throat> I would always walk away late summer. Maybe you go out and do a little deadheading on the florets if you don't want the big brown flowers left after frost. And then walk away. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we walk out in March, and that's when we want to take them down. Now this is going to be the probably the hardest part of this class to convey because I don't know what hydrangeas you have. If you have them in your yard and you have a name on it, great. Then we can tell you how to prune it. If you don't. We're always going to take a chance of maybe pruning it too hard. You know, in my lifetime, I've been doing this about 30 years now at nurseries. The new generation of hydrangeas that started about 2000, just after 2000, all that is new style hydrangeas that bloom on old wood and new wood. So if I look at Endless Summer, I look at all these seaside serenades, I look at the 90% of what a nursery has, like Sunnyside, they're going to bloom on whatever wood you leave. So if I want to prune it hard in March and it's for a smaller plant, great. I still get flower on it. Does that make sense? If I don't want to prune it, I can leave it and get bigger and it's still going to flower just the same. But it gives you the flexibility as a gardener, kind of no-brainer that, okay, it doesn't really matter how far I cut this back to the shape I want. It's going to flush up leaves, set flower buds, and I get the immediate reward that summer of bloom, okay? If I have old school hydrangeas, you know, Nico Blues, Red Wings, Blaumies, I can go on and on. We, we carry quite a few because they're great plants. Those only bloom on, on old wood. So if I have one that's up this tall, I can deadhead my flower or cut down one set of buds, maybe two, and then it shoots up next year and we still get bloom. If I want to go way down, it's not going to hurt the plant. It will let my plant have a chance to rejuvenate, which is great, but I will not have the bloom the next year. So you come to me and say, I don't know what I have. How do I find out? Prune it. See what happens. <laughs> that next year I'd say, okay, you want it down, prune it down and see what happens. Okay, I got minimal flower. I know I have an old wood bloomer. I have to be more careful in the future. Does that make sense? Because again, I think there are spots for both in our yards. You know, old wood bloomers are going to give you a larger you know, six, eight foot tall, six, eight foot wide, you know, great specimen down the road. A lot of those old ones, if I have room, awesome. 
that's a very impressive plant for the garden. The new stuff, <coughs> you know, now I can get down into that three, two, three, even four foot range and have a much smaller plant for a smaller area, which I think is most gardeners these days. I don't have much room left, so I can tuck a small thing in. I don't have room for another eight foot hydrangea, I hate to say, in my own yard. So, <laughs> so that, in a nutshell, you know, that's the difference between a lot of these as we look, is what, is, is it an old wood bloomer or a new wood bloomer? And then we prune it accordingly, okay? But just remember, March, we don't want to get too crazy in the winter. Uh, we get a bad winter, you prune it down in November, sometimes it doesn't matter. We get cold, it kills some wood down, now I got to prune from here and do it again. You know, and go down even farther, or sometimes <laughs> all the way to the root system and then let it start over from scratch again kind of thing, okay? So there's a little pruning. Um, always with these, you know, I drive around and I'm, I, I can't convince you of this because you probably do the same thing. You drive around, you know, I see a mop head hydrangea planted all kinds of places that probably shouldn't be planted. And a lot of people put them in more sun than they should be in. Do they grow? Yes. Do they get sunburned every year? Yes. That's why the red comes out on the leaves a little bit. Um, they get tired late summer. You can water them extra, yes, they'll probably survive, it's not that, but I would always find a morning sun, afternoon shade location for this type of hydrangea. You're going to have a much nicer, healthier plant without having to mess with it as much. If we go, you know, to me it's morning sun, shade afternoon, or the opposite, I've got all day shade and then maybe late in the day, you know, on the the very west side of the house I get a little bit of late afternoon evening sun in the summer okay I'm okay with that too um, or the woodland garden tomorrow in shade plant class we'll be talking a lot about woodland gardens where I have it underneath a tree and again it's sun it's shade it's sun it's shade as the sun kind of goes across it's going to get dappled light I'm fine with that as well you know deep dark shade probably isn't the answer you know hydrangea it's probably going to get a little leggy and stretch and maybe not bloom quite as much but if we can find those morning sun, afternoon shades, or, the, or, or those other two situations I talked about, you, you'll get a get the nicest plant. Um, there's a huge amount of bloom, and you can see by the variety up here, I'll show you a couple of these, but a huge amount of variation from lace cap, double, single, big flower, small flower. There's a couple summer crush down there right now. The flowers have got to be about a foot across. I mean, there's some monster blooms um, on some of these hydrangeas. A lot of the new ones, were bled for the floral industry. So very cool flowers that kind of age and, and change color as they develop. And they'll last three months. You know, one bloom will look totally different for three straight months. Those are all, again, much shorter plants, repeat blooming. We've got a lot of new ones like that as well. But you've got a lot of choices, I think. You know, look at your options. Right now, it's hydrangea time at the nursery. We've got way too many plants out there to probably choose from. So there's a lot of options out there uh, going forward. Now you saw me mention again, not all of them, you can ask after class and I can remind you, but all these we can play with the color. <coughs> so if I'm gonna make this really simple, typically we have acid soil. You could get a pH meter if you wanna check. If you wanna get science guy and get crazy on it, you could check it and change it to a certain number and see what color you get if that's what you wanna do. My mother does that every year, but um, you can go play raspberry red all the way to dark purple. If we look at the tags, like I'll show you on the, the I think the, the endless summer ones have got the best. If I look at the tag out there, there's my range right there. You know, I've got raspberry red on the alkaline side to a deep dark indigo purple on the acidic side. There's no blue in this at all. If I want blue, I'm going for Bloomstruck. Now I can go lavender to blue to purple. So look at the tags and they'll kind of give you your own personal color choices on how they develop. If I want to play with the color, you walk in there, it comes in a can. I should have brought a couple cans in. It comes in a can just like this from the same company as this, as this Grow More. But you'll see uh, aluminum sulfate, it's called hydrangea bluing agent. That makes me more acidic. I want to make sure I have purple or deep dark blue, I can change it to be the acidic side. If I get stump remover, which sounds really funny to buy stump remover, but that's potassium nitrate, that's very alkaline. So I put a little bit of that around my hydrangea, water it in. Now I've made that one little pocket of soil 
in my garden more alkaline, <coughs> now I'm going to get reds, pinks, and, and, and those colors on there too. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Because that's, that's usually a tough one to explain because the pH, this could be probably 800 different shades as it develops. It's really hard in the nursery because some of my growers intentionally will acidify the soil that they plant these in for us. I'll say, hey, can you please make that purple? That's really what it should be. Other ones, they keep red. If I go buy potting soil, you know, or typical soil in a bag, it has no pH to it. So that's what these planted in a nice grower soil. There's no acidity, so I'm going to get red. If I put a little bit of amendment on there, I could turn the next set of blooms on these to a, to a purple color. I can play with the pH that way. So maybe you're going to try, you know, to grow one of these in a small container. Hydrangeas make great container plants um, for the summer. If you don't mind no leaves in the winter, We've got a nice container plant that will bloom and bloom and bloom the entire summer in a pot. If I buy potting soil, that will keep it the pinks and the reds. If I want to have it blue or purple, I'm going to go buy an acidic potting soil. We have an acid mix for rhodes, azaleas, camellias, all those acid loving plants. That would be great for the hydrangea. And now I get the purple color on those. Okay? Is that kind of making sense to everybody? So. If you look at a few of these, I'll just show you a couple because um, there's a lot of them in here and, and a couple in particular that may be a little bit different. Um, this is the Seaside Serenade collection. So if I see that Monrovia uh, pot on there, this is their own brand. You can't get those other nurseries. Um, they developed all those themselves. Those are all varieties of this new generation hydrangea. So I can get bloom on old wood. I get bloom on new wood. Magnificent plants. I have a couple in my own yard. Uh, this year, to show you a couple, uh, this is Glacier Bay. That's a brand new one here for 2022. You can see just starting to bloom, but that's got black stem, which is very pretty, contrasting with white lace cap flower. So that'll be a nice, you know, four foot tall, four foot wide hydrangea. Blooms on new wood, so I can prune it down if I want to. But if I like that lace cap flower, real bright white is sometimes nice, you know, in a shady spot, I'll really see the flower. And the contrast with the black stem is very pretty. That's a little different um, as far as color tone. If we look at the second one here, well, here, let's do this one first. So this is Cape Hatteras. If I want to go, again, small, three, four feet is all, easy to prune, ever blooming. This will give me raspberry red or on the opposite side, more towards, again, that cobalt blue. So I can play with the color on that one as well. That's Cape Hatteras. The, the most popular one around here these days is, is right here called Newport. So this is the one we can get that brilliant purple blue color out of. And again, you can even see by the shape, very small. This is probably the smallest one in their Seaside Serenade collection called Newport. And that would just get two or three feet tall is all um, in the garden. This would be a great one for containers too. This is one I have in a pot at my house. So that would be a nice variety. We just got some more of those. If we look at the next one there, that's Martha's Vineyard. So maybe I want a little bit more pastel, like a pastel pink on the alkaline side versus kind of a lavender soft sky blue on the, on, the, on the acid side. Then we would look at something like Martha's Vineyard. That's another short, repeat blooming, easy to grow one. Um, the last one, well, there's two more here of those. I think this one's really interesting if you saw that one hiding there. So this is one called Cape Lookout. Um, and this is pure white for about a month. And then as the flowers start to age in our soil, we would just get a little flare of that light blue in there. But I would have that beautiful lime green with the white and the light blue. It's a very striking flower. Or again, pastel pink, you know, in a, in a potting soil mix from a grower. So I can play with the color of that a little bit, but I'm always going to have more white than anything. This would be their white option um, as far as varieties. And then if you want something really fun, I've got one of these in my front yard. This is Fire Island. And the other one like this is called the Hamptons. They all got back east names. I wish they didn't, but, um, the, but this is one that we would have the bicolor flower. That is really striking. And I want to make sure we emphasize on this, this Fire Island, this will always be this color. This is not one that we change towards blue or purple. So if I like that white center 
with the kind of reddish outside flare, that's what we would get. Plus, some burgundy on the leaves is really striking too. When this leaves out, it almost looks like a purple black foliage. And then it starts to get more green as we get warmer in the spring and early summer. But that's a really cool flower if you just want that color and not anything else. Okay. <clears throat> and then if we look at maybe a couple other macrophyllas, I think these are pretty cool. I just got a bunch more of these in. So this is a double white lace cap called Wedding Gown. This is kind of from a private grower, a little bit unique, but you can see the double flowers and that's going to have that flat lace cap type flower. So Wedding Gown would be kind of a fun one. Again, repeat blooming, easy to grow. This is that same macrophylla, but we've, but we've got the lace cap flower on it. And then at the end here, we've got a couple of these Revolution series, and I think these are pretty trick. Let's bring a couple out here. So I can get Revolution hydrangeas in any color, same thing. I can play with the pH if I want to. But this is a little different creature to me. This is probably the smallest hydrangeas we have on the property, three foot or less. The biggest stems, so the flowers are not going to flop. This was bred in the Netherlands strictly for florist cutting for hydrangea blooms. Um, and multicolored flowers, if you look at the tags, you can come up after class, you can almost see right there the four different shades I can play with that same plant. So this is not a repeat bloomer. I want to make sure that's clear. This is a little different than these, but its bonus is the flowers last for like four or five months. So when I get a bloom that's all the way open, it's almost tie-dye. It's going to change color every week as we go through the summer. It never turns brown. It doesn't dry like I got a deadheaded. They're very cool for uh, cut arrangements and a, and a nice shaped plant. So we have like, this is, is this revolution? So that would be the one I'd want if I like more blues and purples with lime green and different tones. Very cool flower. I could change that to red, a bright crimson red if I wanted to. So we have Revolution. This is the pink. <clears throat> and it's open just a little bit more so you can kind of start seeing where I get those multicolored flowers out on that. That's a great variety. And then we have a white. You know, if I just want white, and you'll see these as they age again, pick up a lot of lime green and some different colors on those as well. But I won't get blue or red, just white on their on their white variety like that. So this is that Revolution series. Um, you know, again, I think one of the better choices for container growing, and especially if you like to cut the flowers and maybe bring them in here and there, those are pretty cool. They would last a long time. Those are those are nice and nice and short as well. Okay. If uh, I think we got all, oh, the last couple, so we saw, <clears throat> you'll see the blue pot there. You know, if we rewind to 2000, like I mentioned, that is the original reblooming hydrangea, the endless summer collection from Bailey Nurseries. They did a lot of time breeding and getting a really quality hydrangeas. There's a number of them in that series. The original one we still carry. There's a lace cap called Twist and Shout, if I like a lace cap. This is Summer Crush, which was the last one to come out. Um, and then you see Bloomstruck down there. He's looking a little tired, but he'll, he'll spring back to life here in the ground. But all those Bailey ones, um, really heavy flowering. They're very nice plants. Um, and that's kind of the original sequence of those as well. We carry all the varieties down there. Uh, there's even one called Blushing Bride. It's a white one again. Um, but we've got repeat flowering, shorter plants, easy to prune that I would have that repeat flowering all the way till frost. So anything in the blue pots, you'll see that Endless Summer logo. Those are all great, great choices as well. Uh, there is just one more I'm trying out. And again, um, if you can, if you can, it's not quite blooming yet. <clears throat> but if you can see that picture on there, um, this is one, again, I'd have really pretty kind of florist quality hydrangeas. This is Tilt-A-Swirl, and this would be another short one repeat flowering again but i would have the pink the red the lime green or on the opposite end the blues the purples and the lime green but again a very large flower on a really easy grow plant you can see they're just starting to kind of pop out their first flowers here now midsummer so and it's not all of them i hate to say i could have probably done this till one o'clock if we brought one of every 
hydrangea in. So just because I didn't bring it in doesn't mean it's worthwhile, but I just tried to bring in a little sample to kind of show you the variation because there's a lot of good choices out there uh, for mop head hydrangeas. Um, just a couple that next that next section you'll see is hydrangea serrata and that's one that they call mountain hydrangea so on the corner over here if you see just a couple um, you'll see preziosa this has got the pink okay and you can see a little bit different foliage on that one we have old school this is about the prettiest one if you've got an old this is one called bluebird big lace cap and that is a big huge wide hydrangea if you had the room if i had the room that would be one of the first old-fashioned ones i would grab we'll, we'll do questions here right at the end okay um Bl bluebird is one we would have a big wide maybe as tall as me but wider that would make a big old specimen for the for the part shape garden and then probably on the newer side from proven winter we have some things like <clears throat> like uh, tough stuff so these are serrata hydrangeas or they call mountain hydrangeas the biggest difference for me with those the same idea lace cap round flowers we can get some different varieties but they're a little hardier so maybe if i lived up in the hills maybe had some wood death in the winter on a cold one that's a little hardier and all these if you've had hydrangea you know they kind of i hate to say turn to kind of snot in the fall they turn yellow and just kind of melt with frost and you just kind of rake them up and get rid of them the serratas i would get fall color so if i want a flower all summer through fall and i want a brighter red or burgundy i would get a superior fall color on those types of on the serrata types of hydrangea okay so keep that's a little little bit little bit different uh than the macrophyllus for those two reasons now if I want to go big, the next one on there is hydrangea arborescence. So if we were in the Midwest, you know, somewhere and you've seen pictures, I'm sure, like just massive, you know, almost basketball sized white flowers. You know, those are the smooth hydrangeas. I brought one here. So a little bit different leaf. These take all day sun. They make great clipped hedges, you know, if you like a, a good sunny hedge. Um, this is a massive flower. You walk out there and see some after class that are already tall. I mean, I, I would have a flower like the size of this when that's fully mature. So arborescence, um, if I like white and I want sun, that may be a good choice for you. This is one called Incrediball that came out of Proven Winners. That's a newer variety. But we would have other options back there on dwarfs like Wee White. There's a one for uh, breast cancer. Uh, called Invincible Spirit that's got some pink in it. There's Invincible Ruby. There's a Lime Meta if you like more lime green white um, But those would be shorter. These are the ones if I let this go I would end up with a nice six foot tall full sun hydrangea if I want want that type, okay? So keep that in mind for sun That's one that we could we could give a little bit more hot cooking sun to those are ones they can grow in the, in the hot Midwest climates even. Again, as long as they're getting water, it's still like a little little drink. Those are not drought tolerant, okay? Now, if we looked at oak leaf hydrangeas, does anyone have an oak leaf hydrangea? We've got a few. You know, that one again, we start to get into what we call these panicle type flowers. So they're starting to set here in summer. These will all, never turn blue or any colors, but they will always open white and then turn light pink medium pink towards red depending on what color or variety you have some go red a little quicker other ones stay white a little longer but i'm always going to have white flower fading into pinks and reds towards fall now this has got a cool leaf for one looks a little more like an oak leaf hence its name but superior fall color you know this is one maybe in the dead of winter sometimes they keep most of their leaves they don't even drop them all i would have reds purples, burgundies, oranges, yellows, all kinds of colors on the fall foliage. And these aren't quite old enough, but I would have a really cool kind of peely bark on oak leaf hydrangeas. This is a plant that would get cinnamon bark and it looks kind of cool even if it's dormant, a little bit like a paper bark type maple or something. So cool bark in the winter, nice fall color would be the additions with these. Now I, oak leaves are old wood bloomers. So yes, I can do a little pruning and tidying but I can't cut these back super hard. They'll always grow, but I won't get the flower the next season. Keep that in mind with pruning. Um, and this is one, honestly, 
We could probably grow just about anywhere. I wouldn't go deep dark shade, but I could go full sun or part sun, either afternoon or morning, as long as I'm watering on something like this, okay? The, the big thing probably back there for choice, uh, this is, I think, is this peewee? Which one did I bring? I brought ruby slippers. So ruby slippers, you, you probably guess, we'll play a guessing game here. What do you think, what, what color do you think that turns? Ruby red. So that one was named because it will turn red a little bit quicker versus just white. If we have another style here, this is Gatsby's out of Proven Winners. You know, again, nice, nice shape, nice foliage, nice bloom would turn a little bit later to more of a lighter pink color as that develops. But look at your heights would probably be the biggest difference with a lot of those oak leaves. You know, do I want something like peewee or a dwarf that might just get three-ish foot tall? Or do I want a little larger specimen that might be four or five feet tall on some of those, some of those bigger growers, okay? So that's oak leaf. <clears throat> probably the biggest selection right now, we'll get into the, the we call PG hydrangeas or panicle type hydrangeas. So anyone have PGs in their yard? We've got a couple. Yeah, that's that to me is the supreme all summer long blooming uh, shrub for some. You know, if you're not into roses, those would be the two to me that I would have maximum flower power over the entire summer till frost. So if we look at panicle type, you know, there's a lot of choice in here, I bet you we probably have 20 different panicle hydrangeas after the deliveries this week. Um, I have a hard time saying no to any of them. We're gonna have to start picking and choosing because I can't have 20 kinds of hydrangea here every year. So we're gonna do a little picking and choosing going forward. But there are some great choices is the point. Everybody's got great options, different growers, different breeders, and there's some fabulous plants uh, to choose from. So if I bring up a couple of PGs, so if we talk some general things, PGs I like because they bloom on new wood. So if I say that to you, you know I teach pruning classes here, that's the no-brainer pruning. I could do whatever I want to a PG hydrangea in March. I can cut it back, I can leave it alone, I can tidy it up, I can do whatever I want. Whatever grows that spring is going to immediately set a flower bud and I have the reward of flowering that summer. So I like that flexibility I think for a lot of gardeners I think some people are afraid of pruning uh, when it comes down to it. It's like, well, if I cut it too hard, I won't flower. Doesn't matter on these. I mean, that's a really easy plant uh, to care for. When I have a bloom like this, you know, let's just pretend that, well, if you can see, if I have one bloom like that up, right? Right now, it goes through the season. This one will turn red by the time summer's over. We go through winter. Next March, I could pick any pair of buds on that entire stem and prune above it, now I get two shoots and two flowers. So this year I have probably 40 flowers on that thing coming out. Next year it's 80, the year after that it's 100, you know, it just goes out exponentially. So prune a little tidying will A, increase your flower count, but also keep your plant much more compact. As you're choosing, <clears throat> you know, as you're choosing a PG, this is the, probably the most popular shrub around here in the summer, you know, find somewhere sunny, you know, you're going to be able to water a little bit, especially until it gets established. But look at the heights and how quick they go from white to pink to red. Some people like pink. I'm not a huge pink guy. I like the white to red. Some people like more pink. Let's get one that stays a little bit more on the pinky tones for you. But that's going to be the difference between all these PGs. I brought probably seven or eight of them in here. We probably have 20 to choose from. It's going to be height. How big does it tend to get? And what does the flower color age to and how quickly? So those are kind of your choices on, on hydrangeas. Now, if we look at a few, you'll see the purple pots here. You know, this is Bailey's uh, first edition. Bailey Nurseries is a great place back in Minnesota. They have a growing operation in Oregon now. So we're able to access a lot of their cool shrubs. You know, these are plants they've spent years breeding. And most of these actually came out of Europe uh, to a breeder in southern France, to be honest with you, um, where they're able to partner with and get some really cool new varieties in. So I think Bailey has quite a few excellent uh, PGs. If we start at the front here, is that little hottie or is that Strawberry Sunday? They're starting to look awful close. So this is Strawberry Sunday. So you can look at the picture after class here and see the nice pink tones that that gets. But this is a much tighter flower 
It's not a huge grower. That one's about four or five feet tall when we get an old plant. It's their dwarfish one like that. But I'm gonna have that clear white flower getting to a light to medium pink um, over the summer towards the fall. That's strawberry Sunday. If I look at something like this one, this is Diamond Rouge, one of my favorites. So a little bit looser flower, looser panicles, not quite as dense, right? A little different shape. But this was going to turn red and much quicker. So if I want to go white, kind of skip a little bit on the pink and go more towards the red or rouge color, I'm going to probably go for Diamond Rouge. That's an excellent grower uh, for some that's a, that's a little, little, uh, little more on the red color, okay? So Diamond Rouge, you saw Vanilla Strawberry. This one came out last year. This one's called Little Hottie. So that's a funny name. But this is one again, four foot-ish or so, really heavy flowering. That's a big, huge, tight flower, a little bit like Vanilla Strawberry, um, but probably one of the heaviest bloomers I've seen come out. When we get those plants in, it's been two years since this one came out. Um, always really heavy flowering. So that's a little hottie. If I want to go bigger, I've got a couple more. Oh, those are the proven winners. I thought I brought a, a vanilla strawberry in, but I might have forgot. So we go strawberry sundae, diamond or little hottie, diamond rouge. Now, if I want something six foot, seven foot, a big specimen plant for sun, I'm going to choose some of the bigger ones out there, like limelight from proven winners. Vanilla Strawberry is one of the most popular ones. Pinky Winky is a funny named one that a lot of people have known. Um, that's another tall one. There's some great tall options in that five to seven foot range. So I've kind of got specimen sun, or we can scale it down a little bit with some of these more dwarf guys. If you see at the back here, you'll see the same flower, right? We got panicle flower, panicle flower. You know, in all my years, um, I can't tell you how many of you gardeners come in and find me or the staff and say, hey, I'm looking for a flowering tree. Okay, well, what do we look, what season do you want to bloom? Well, I like summer. How big do you want it to get? Uh, I don't know, maybe six, eight, maybe 10 feet at the most. Well, is that really a tree or is it really a large shrub? I mean, a lot of times when we play 20 questions, it's like, no, I wanted a big, tall PG hydrangea, you know, or you know, other tall, lilac, you know, is another example of, you call it a shrub, we call it a small tree either way. This is actually a tree. You know, if I pull one of these out, let me just grab one here. You know, look at that. So we have a place like Bailey's that will graft these onto their own rootstock, spend years to grow that up out of the ground and then turn it into a tree. So this is exactly the same. I think this is, this is vanilla strawberry the one we don't have in shrub form. So this is exactly the same thing as a hydrangea, but now I have a trunk that I can grow a five, six, seven foot tall hydrangea on top of that. So I plant this, I keep it staked, you know, until it gets a thicker trunk, but that is a magnificent small tree. You know, I plant that in the sun in my yard and I have a tree look that I want that blooms all summer, but I've got that repeat flowering, easy to prune, all those things and it will never get crazy like a plum, a cherry, a crab apple, a dogwood or, or other typical flowering trees we have around here. So, so these are usually a popular choice of the class. They're not cheap, but with the class discount we'll talk about at the end, that's a great purchase to look around if you like a little, a little tree form hydrangea. Those are really easy to do, okay? Now the last one here I'll show you, I think, well actually we'll, I, I gotta show you the last couple panicles. So probably, I think, did you guys take them all before class? <laughs> the, you know, proven winners, you'll see the white pots. Everyone recognizes the white pot everywhere. You know, proven winner, they call them color choice shrubs. You know, they spend a lot of breeding time, a lot of genetics all over the country at different locations, breeding new varieties of all kinds of plants, annuals, perennials, shrubs, just about everything in our garden. If you see the white pot, it's always proven winner but they continue every year to introduce two, three more hydrangeas, something new that we can have in our yards. They all, we're waiting for these to show up. They just came this week. So this one, this one is called Firelight Tidbit. So I would say it's replaced, it's set the new standard for 
a small hydrangea that only grows two or three feet tall. So these are PGs. They'll turn red again a little quicker. They open white like they all do. But that is probably the smallest one I've seen. I think that's going to take the new cake for the, the most dwarf of all these uh, PGs. That's what it was made for. We get regular firelight. Not tidbit, but firelight would be up again, taller than me. Now we've taken that down to, to something waist level, okay? So firelight tidbit's brand new. Uh, here's a couple fun ones. I, I just got this the, uh, yesterday. This is the new one. I don't think it's supposed to be out for another year, but I thought it had a great name. It's called Pufferfish. So this is one that's got a little bit rounder, which is like a little puffer fish. It's got a little tight white flower. It's a little more rounder like that. That's hence the name. So again, not a super large grower, easy to grow because of the new wood bloom, but probably a little bit rounder flower. We'll wait and see when that one blooms. And then I've had, this is little lime. So again, I, if I, we're all honest in here, I'm not a huge pink guy. So I, and I like PGs, so I wanted to go from white and not as much pink, okay, before we get to fall. So when I planted mine years ago, I chose Little Lime. This is the dwarf version of Limelight, which maybe a lot of people might, we have that out there too. Um, little Lime grows more like four feet tall. I can use it in my sunny garden spot and get hundreds of flowers all through the summer. But this one will open lime, then go white, then get a little hints of pink in it a little bit later in summer fall. So I don't have as much of the pink for me, my own personal choice long season. I've got more of the lime green to white flower, which really pops out in the sunshine. So little lime is the dwarf. Let's say you're the opposite of me <laughs> and you're like, well, I like the pink a little bit more than he does. This is the other brand new one this year. You can see on that picture, it's called little lime punch. So the same plan as that, but now I go lime green white very quickly and I immediately get into those pinky red colors like the Hawaiian punch colors towards towards summer, okay? So that's another new new good dwarf one. And the last one, if I was gonna recommend another one to look for out there, is Bobo. You know, this, that one and, uh, and uh, Firelight Tidbit are gonna have a battle here this year and see who wins for the, the most dwarf with the most flowers. Because typically I would probably say Bobo is one nice compact plant, you know, three foot tall with a lot of bloom which is what that will do as well, the tidbit. But Bobo, uh, maybe a little bit more white again for a longer season, a little bit more pink to red a little quicker on the, on the tidbit, okay? So I've got, we just got some more nice Bobos in out there as well. Oh, there's my, see there's my tidbit. You got big ones, I got a little guy. There's the, there's the firelight starting to open, okay? So there's some PGs. Um, the last one I'll mention real quick, you'll see on your sheet, is some hydrangea vines. <clears throat> now, if we do a hydrangea class, we probably could just do all shreds. But mentioning a few vines, um, I think it's worth it as well. I have a couple of these in my own yard. Um, does anyone have hydrangea, climbing hydrangea of any kind? Get a couple? Yeah. So, we've got some options for vines. Um, the most common question around here in vine world is, um, what's evergreen? You know, everyone wants an evergreen vine. And if you think of that, it's a very subtropical type plant. We're not very hardy. All this stuff would have gotten nipped a little bit last winter um, on the evergreen vine side. But there are some good evergreen hydrangeas. We've got one growing on a tree right out in front of the nursery. We can go show you after the class. It'll climb up bark. It'll root into a fence. I'd be careful not to let it root into your siding. I have one at my house and I just keep it away from my house and on a structure um, so it looks nice. But this is one that would actually root right into brick, concrete, wood, all those things um, and attach itself. And I can make a really nice vine look with that. Again, after class, if you're interested, I'll, I'll go show you. We got them all over our fence down here as well. But this is the evergreen option. They call hydrangea integrifolia. So that's got evergreen foliage. Again, they're all zone seven. So if we get a nippy winter, maybe you get a little bit of die back this last winter, I think would have for sure. Then it shoots back up in the spring and off we go kind of thing. Um, but you'll see integrifolia or a rounder leaf one called Samanii. You'll see those both on your list um, as evergreen options for climbing hydrangea. If we go, ones that lose their leaves in the winter deciduous 
This is the one I have at my yard because I love variegation. So this is one we call Miranda or Firefly. I'm going to have that yellow edge on dark green. This gets a big white lace cap flower in the early summer. Mine's in bloom right now. It's almost done. I'll cut the flowers off and then I'll get to enjoy the foliage the rest. Um, these will lose their leaves, so they'll turn color in the fall, drop their leaves. If you can look on probably the green one here, we can say a little better. It's kind of like the oak leaves. I mean, even when this is, <coughs> excuse me, looking dead as a doornail in the summer, really cool bark. You know, this is one we would have that peely cinnamon kind of gnarly bark on. So my old one that's near the house in an old art piece that I trained um, really looks cool in the winter too. It doesn't have a leaf left on it but it's very attractive with the bark and the structure. So, so this is what we would make call American climbing hydrangea. This is the plain species that's just green leaf. The variegated one is the Miranda. And give these some room to grow. You know, that if I popped a hydrangea in and I never pruned it, a climbing hydrangea, and I just walked away, I bet you that would cover like 60 or 70 feet as it gets old. So this is one, you got an old fence, chain link you know an old shed you'd want to grow something on there really cool to grow but manage it a little bit if you've got room awesome you know i got a little square i want to keep mine in so every year just a little bit of pruning and i can kind of keep it contained in that same area okay but if i plant that and let it go it will uh will eat up some serious room all right so let's go i think that's probably hydrangea overload did we show you a little bit of everything so do we got questions here? And then I'll, I'll do, talk a little bit about sales. Yeah. Um, how do you tell, that's a question. On those seaside ones, what yep. size pot would you put them in? Well, if, if I get, and it's not probably just those, but let's just say I'm getting one of these new generation hydrangeas, you know, that I, stays reasonable, grows in a pot. Hydrangeas are a lot of root systems, so it probably wouldn't be forever. But if I got a two foot by two foot pot, I'd be happy in there for a number of years. Um, I would be walking out, it's not just hydrangea with containers, um, I would walk out every spring and stick my finger inside the rim of the pot. Am I feeling like super hard surface root or do I have a little bit of soil left? And then I thought, okay, it's a little bit root bound, I could do some root pruning, shift it to a larger pot or whatever. But if you had two by two, I think that would keep you, keep you happy for quite a few years. That it should tell you on there if it doesn't ask, um, but again, you know, probably for us, like 95% of what's out there is, is a new generation. We try to make this easy. We've got some old school ones because they are nice. Um, anything from Monrovia is all going to be that way. Anything from Endless Summer is all going to be that way. And then there's a couple other kind of fun ones that, that would as well. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to the food, the yeah, that's a great question. So if I'm going to feed, you know, feeding a new one when you put it in, great. We can mix it in the hole. We can put some on top, water it in. For an old one, I use a lot of compost. It could be bark if you like bark. But I would always go out, feed it a rim around there in March, and get some fresh mulch over the top of it. If you don't, turn your water on, you know, probably not like, you know, power wash type thing. But if you put it on a little bit of a jet, you can kind of flush that into the soil. Eventually, it'll make its way in. But if we wash it in real good or do it when it's raining regularly which it'll be in march that'll get it down to the root system a little quicker yeah. Yeah. all right yes i think i have a large hydrangea that gets big i didn't realize it okay um but i am cutting it back so it stays below the bedroom window okay is that still okay yeah it's, it, again it? i, I want to make that sure of pruning because i'm never going to hurt any of these by pruning the, the sacrifice would be the flower, and if you're not getting as much bloom, it's probably just because we had to prune it a little bit. Um, if, if you want my recommendation, because I like old school hydrangeas, it's not, you know, I think there's some fabulous old ones that deserve to be in gardens. Um, I would try to, you know, bite the bullet every, every few years. Maybe I let it go, I enjoy bloom, I enjoy bloom, okay, I can wait for one year, cut it way back. You know, let it inch back up, bloom again, bloom again, and then cut it back, you know, kind of thing. If you do, you know, a light, if you just go down a bud, or maybe two, you'll probably be okay. But if I got to go down a little more than that, then we would sacrifice a little bit of the flower. But it's never going to hurt the plant. Okay. Yeah. In, yeah. In March is the best time to prune? Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I want to reiterate that because I, you know, and again, I, 
do you get away with it most years? Yeah, probably. But if you wanted to always play it safe, I would always skip the fall. I walk out around the holidays in my yard, and I just don't want that flower, brown, heavy, wet, snow, snapping a branch. Mm. So all as I do in the fall is walk around and just real quickly snip, 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 throw all the brown flowers in the yard waste, in the yard waste bin, see you later. Okay, then in the spring, I can do my, my wood pruning. Yeah. I'm trying to decide whether to put a tree hydrangea yep. or a, probably, I got a pair of old hydrangeas. I took them back 24 inches, so yep. two, two, root, two joints. Okay. And I took them back, and they're about six and a half feet tall now. <laughs> yeah. So that would be great. All I want is some foliage for the neighbor over the top of a six foot fence. Exactly. Yeah. Should I use that one or buy a tree one? I would say either way, you went yeah, tall no. shrub. It's probably, to, to me, the, the tree solved a gap because a lot of people, again, ask me for a one trunk tree that they can garden underneath. That would be the benefit of that. I could put sure. that on my fence put lavenders and perennials and little shrubs, I could do whatever I want underneath it. With the shrub, I'm stuck with seven trunks and I'm, I'm not gardening underneath. And that one there, those are both trees, right? Those are both trees and I've got other ones out there. We've got, I've, I've got vanilla strawberry, limelight, berry white. I should say berry white, right? They get a little deep. So look, uh, look, look, look at berry white out there. And that, the difference with that one would be, I, again, I want pink red fast. So it's a massive flower, but you'll see on the tag, look at the pictures, because it's going to show you, oh wow, that's really a, a pinky ruby red color. Where this one, I'm going to be more white to pastel pink. Yeah. 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 Are, are any of them scented? Uh, they are not. There's a couple, um, and I have a couple out there, if I remember. Let's see, Felicity. There's a couple they say have light fragrance. Um, my nose isn't the best these days, but... Um, I don't smell them. I think they might just a little, it's not going to be like Daphne, Gardenia, anything like that. Just get a little light fragrance out of them in the sun. Yeah. All right. So let's have some fun here. So class specials, the hydrangeas are 20 off. So if you want to go shopping, they've already grabbed a few. Um, go shopping after class. The trees, the shrubs, anything hydrangea period is all 20% off. And that's today all the way through Friday. We, as you know, we've been doing all these online, you know, for three years now since COVID hit. It's awesome to be back live again, but you, we, we wanted to make this easy. We've had a lot of people say they like sitting on the couch in their pajamas that I don't want to see and drinking coffee and, you know, watching at home and that's fine. So we didn't want to alienate them. We had others I know that were just as excited like I'm sick of watching my computer like he is. I want to come down there again and get some live instruction. So, so, Think of it that way, you know, you, you can take advantage of it today, you can come down anytime this week. The sale's good through Friday. You just gotta tell our cashier, I was at Trevor's Boring Hydrangea class, give me my 20%, I sat through an hour of crap, right? No, I'm just kidding. So, so, so class special, um, we've got a lot of other stuff on special. I know she brought in a cartload of perennials, but 30% off perennials, there's some great specials going around the nursery. Our famous take me home department is back up, half price plants. I'll speak for me running this place. We don't put dead back there. The dead goes in the garbage. We're not trying to sell you something that won't grow. So a lot of times, probably half my yard came out of the half price department because I'm like, ooh, I can get that back to health. You know, where a lot of times it's perennials that are done blooming and you get half price, sweet, I'll see you next year anyway, and they look fabulous again. So, so take a look at the half price. Um, I would like to thank the Ever Clinic again. We're gonna do some gift card giveaways here now um, for sponsoring our class. You know, that's a, that's a sweet deal, I think, for us and for you, honestly. Again, it doesn't do anything for me or Sunnyside, but having them sponsor allows me to give away five $50 gift cards here right now oh. uh, to the class, to the cl people who come to the class. We were doing it online. Sorry, online people. But uh, now we do it, now we can do it live again. Yes? How much sun does the Glacier Bay need? Um, again, I, I, would, I wouldn't go deep, dark shade, like where I, I get zero direct light. But, you know, a couple hours is plenty, especially being a white one. If I had morning sun or, again, a woodland garden underneath the tree where I get a little bit of light shade, a little bit of light shade, you'll be so fine with that. the east side of the property? E east or north. I, I, unless you've got a lot of coverage, south or west is going to be a little tougher. Yeah, east or north is perfect. East would be ideal. I think most people 
to me, if we go back and take this type of hydrangea, I think more customers put them in way too much sun or deep dark shade and get a little bit disappointed. It's not like they won't grow, but it's why is it so leggy and stretchy? You got it in way too much shade. There's no light in there or vice versa. It's going okay in sun and it's blooming and it's growing, but why does it kind of look a little tired? Well, you got too much afternoon sun on it too, okay? Um, we'll do this once a month. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll stay live now um, here the rest of the year. We'll still record them like I mentioned, um, but we'll do this again in August. I think the last, I'm going on vacation for a couple weeks in August finally. So the last weekend in August, I think I have fall grasses and we're doing a big summer perennial class. Um, it'll be one of those two that we'll have the gift cards as well for, so, okay?